Well, the, uh, the, the, the target presentation was more going to be on uh, material recovery and, and how it's changed throughout the years with um, recyclables. But literally, I started my career writing the uh, first solid waste management plan for the city of Chicago. And uh, I think that was the first time I was called a hippie. Uh, because it was back in 1982 when we started, in 83 when we actually, they actually decided that we had to uh, do something else. And you have to understand, you know, a lot of political things get talked about. But in Chicago, uh, there was usually one way of doing things, and it was, you know, the mayor's way. Now that was the previous mayor daily, and then you had the new mayor daily. Uh, now we're going into a new uh, regime. So I grew up, uh, I grew up in that uh, solid waste environment. Uh, also worked for the second, at the time, the second largest waste company in the world, BFI, um, basically doing mergers and acquisitions. So I was the guy that bought the hauling companies. I was the guy that uh, cited and permitted the landfills. Uh, but I'm also proud of the fact that I was the guy that when uh, Bill Ruckelshaus joined the firm, he said, we got to get more into recycling like we did before. And my comment was, if you long as you have markets to sell stuff, it shouldn't be a problem. So that led the cause over the next 10 years to work with the pulp and paper industry uh, to get the inking capacity put out because we didn't have it. Uh, also led with companies like Pepsi and Coke. Uh, we had a bottle out there, I don't know how many uh, people remember the original bottle. You had three different types of plastic. You had a rigid bottom um, on it, which was high density polyethylene, or number two, and you had a number one as the body, and then you had actually a mix that would be in the cap. So the solid waste guys, if you will, became the recyclers and the enforcement of all the regulations. And I thought that was kind of unfair. But as a business plan, I thought it was great. Um, and I also uh, was the manager of business development for the Waste Energy Group for BFI American Refuel. And that's when I started working with the ash residues and built the only uh, production scale plant that used bottom and fly ash uh, in an unregulated fashion to make paper bricks. Um, had a little financing from a guy named Mark Cuban um, accidentally, but uh, he could actually tell that he was green at one time. Um, I'm not sure what Mark is now, but he, back, back then he wasn't Mark Cuban. Basketball player? Yeah, but uh, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, he was one of those guys that thought it was a great idea. Well, look, there's a lot of great ideas out there. Do they make money? Do they work? Do you have markets? So that's how all the material recovery uh, aspects come in. Because I remember spending several million dollars on all the wrong equipment on the first curbside recycling program. Not myself, but obviously I was in charge of it. And I would ask the uh, garbage guys who were trying to do recycling. I said, why do you have three containers at the curb? And they said, well, one's for paper, one's for glass, and one's for aluminum. I said, what about the bimetal? What about the cardboard? What about all the rest of the stuff? And they're like, well, we only have three containers. And then they begin. So they bought trucks, and they bought trucks because they were new trucks. And they were new trucks because it was something cool to buy. And they had all the containers then in the trucks. And I said to myself, I said, what we need to do is take the containers versus the fiber fraction and focus on that. And they're like, well, how's that going to be? I said, well, it's going to increased collection, because now our collection costs are increasing because we have two trucks where we were running before we had a garbage truck. So we're taking the recyclables out of the garbage and putting them in the new recycling truck that at that time cost $100,000 and had two guys on it. Originally they thought they could do it with one guy, but there was so much pent up demand for recycling that the trucks were full literally in a couple hours um, during their route. And they were full with newspaper with no market. Um, and they were full with all the stuff that we had no markets for. So what I had to do was focus on the market development part of that, while still having operational experience and responsibilities to deal with the district managers who said, you got us into this recycling mess, you got to get us out. Uh, and the way to get it out was to go meet with Fort Howard up in Wisconsin and say, if you build the capacity, it will come. Uh, they laughed. Uh, but then when BFI, Waste Management, and a couple of the regional haulers got together, uh, we started comparing notes, and that's really the communication part of this was really important. And again, this is 83, 84, 85, um, and now we realize that we needed some place to actually dump our recyclables and, and grade them, grading meaning uh, get them to the market, because yeah, it's one thing to collect them, and, and that's the municipal uh, view of it, is you're recycling once it's on the curb. Well, there's a whole other section, as you know, a whole other section of, of once you grab them and then where they end up, and they need to end up in the market. And it was all cost. They wanted it for free. They didn't realize it was costing us over $100 a ton uh, to collect something that we could put in the landfill at that time for under $20 a ton. All right, so well, you should recycle because it's good. And I had warehouses full of bale paper with no place to go, right? So we looked at focusing on the markets, and that's really how 
Uh, and there were a lot of companies that came in, solar, real similar to like the solar industry and all the renewable energy. You know, all these companies had all these recycling programs, a lot from Germany, uh, a lot from all over the country, Japan, and they wanted to computerize everything. And uh, a lot of proposals that we put together to basically do it a little bit lower tech, uh, basically saying, okay, we have a sort line, and the sort line seems to work pretty well. I consider those green collar jobs, and those were 1985. All right. Um, so I had 15 employees uh, picking paper. Uh, they were picking paper. They were picking cardboard. Uh, they were picking different types of plastic. We didn't have the. We didn't even have the plastic uh, labeling system back then. Uh, one of the things that evolved from actually the garbage guys getting with the plastic guys, getting with who the end user, right? What specification do you want your newspaper? What specification do you want your your old corrugated cardboard? Uh, your plastics, what you know, you have to be separated by color. Uh, glass was the most problematic uh, because it broke the most uh, and it provided some of the contaminants. And then you had all the stuff that what we used to call the schmutz left out at the end of the sorting line. Mixture of paper, glass, some other stuff that there was no uh, home for. Uh, so I'm talking with the paper mills and we focused a lot on paper because it was about 75 to 80 percent of everything that came on the curbside programs, right? And the trucks would be filled with paper. Well, you get the newsprint, okay? The newsprint we grade up, uh, so most of it was ONP6, but then we would get the Sunday inserts, and those were clay coated. People didn't realize that. They had lead based inks instead of soy based inks. So it sounds funny sitting here, I haven't given her a talk on recycling for probably a decade, but to think about the aspects of what changed the material recovery and what we focused on, what we pulled out of the waste stream initially was great, uh, but now we're on the sorting line and we're thinking about. Okay, what's the next? Well, styrofoam, right? And you look at all those other things. So the, the labeling programs with the plastics were, were a godsend because then we knew what to focus on. Now again, this isn't rocket science, but you know, in the early 90s now, you've got the state of Wisconsin banning recyclables from the landfill. I'm running landfills. I'm not running a recycling center. Well, guess what? I was running three recycling centers because I couldn't put them into the landfill. And I was doing the recycling at the landfills because whatever was left over, the schmutz, if you will, it went in uh, to the landfill, but then we started looking at that and saying, well, wait a second, if we do secondary recovery, we can probably do something with that. Not a big market on it, uh, but we started using that as an alternative daily cover to putting dirt on the garbage. Right? And we said, well, that's not recycling. Well, guess what? It's done pretty prevalently now with a lot of different other uh, industrial waste. Uh, so moving with the pulp and paper industry, when I left BFI and sort of moved to that next career and did it for myself, uh, I took the expertise of that decade of experience in saying, hey, you guys in the pulp and paper mill, now you're generating all this waste fiber sludge. If you dry it and you can get the heat that's going up the stack of that big boiler that's burning coal and maybe some wood, uh, we can dry that paper mill sludge for you and you could use that back in your boiler. Well, it just goes to the landfill. Well, as landfill prices went up, landfill regulations caused a couple of few of the regional landfills up in the middle of nowhere to close, I would get a phone call. Hey, that, that idea you had a couple of years ago. And so then I would start prospecting the recycling opportunities inside of, of a mill. Um, and I didn't go to the electronics recycling as much as you'll hear later, but it was like going back to the future, the old CRTs that they had. Um, I said, well, you know, you need to get rid of those. We, have a, we had a big layoff, and uh, that was seven years ago, and they had old computers and everything else. So what we did is we sort of, you know, took it upon ourselves to deal with the local guys. They said, hey, I need your truck. I said, well, i got to take this stuff either down to Wausau or down to Milwaukee or uh, we're going to have somebody pick it up, but you need to get rid of this stuff because sustainability became more important. We started focusing on energy. We started looking at taking some of the chip mill waste and recycling that. So we looked at all these things, but it came down to the markets, the ability to identify where those markets were at, and how to basically work with you know the end users. So when you start looking at, um, again, I don't want to steal any thunder, we start taking apart uh, a computer. You know, There's different ways you want to deconstruct that thing because there's a lot of value in there if you know what you're doing. Right? And part of that's you know, training. But what we were looking at was the municipal side of it, and then we moved into the commercial side. And again, with Florida Recycling Services down here, uh, I worked with them on several of their uh, transfer stations and put in a huge recycling component because they were a private sector company and they were the largest independent recycling company in Florida at the time. We, they sold to a, a company a few years ago. But we were sending all of the waste from the transfer station to um, landfills owned primarily by the counties. So we would go to the county with a proposal basically recycle uh, material on the front end and put in bailing operation, no cost to the county, uh, but we were reducing the amount of volume that was going to the county landfills. So you want to talk about politics, you know. And then they said, well, we got this guy from Chicago that's going to show us how to do all this stuff in Florida. 
It was an interesting two years, but we got three facilities built, the one in Sanford, uh, Florida, that was built uh, after the acquisition, was one of the more successful ones, uh, recycling, I think, over a thousand tons a day. And all that did was save money, and you got to think of the economic impact. It saved money by reducing the material going to the landfill, and you saved carbon by not having those trucks go to the landfill. So when you put all that stuff together and you design the facility, which is what we do, because uh, I have a small engineering company, when you design that facility, you set it up for all that material to come in, you want to be the traffic cop of all that material. So it sounds kind of interesting now that when I go to the, the, the mills and I look at what the mills are, it's pretty easy. If you're a steel mill, you're, you're recycling the FB or the iron uh, of that, and that's pretty much a Sims metal management issue because it's such large volumes, all right? But guess what? We consult, or we used to consult with metal management uh, to try to get the in-between, get that margin stuff and then try to find out the stuff that when they, um, when they are taking the slag from the steel mill and they extract the metal out of it, they're left with a, a product that's a gravel-like product. Well, I use that in a cementitious process. Not all of it, but some of it. And this is the material that's left over after making uh, recycled metal, melting in electric arc furnaces. And then going from there and doing coal ash. Um, and we're working on a project in Virginia where we're converting coal ash into a lightweight aggregate, replacing natural lightweight aggregate. And we're using it, speaking of stormwater, as uh, we talked about earlier, we created a stormwater uh, block. It's a 40-pound block, 42-pound block, that reservoirs the water underneath. Uh, the, only, the first installation was done in December in Bladensburg, Maryland. So we replaced the retention pond uh, because we put it all underneath. Now, that block weighs 42 pounds. Using the recycled, 100% recycled uh, coal ash into the aggregate, I've lightened it up by 8 pounds. So that means I put more units on a truck. I can get them placed, and they're placed, it's called an articulated block. So we actually have cable going through, and they're laid in sections. Anywhere from two foot to six foot wide, 10 foot long, they're laid in. Those are green collar jobs. And now that unit's gonna be 100% recycled material with crushed concrete, which I work with a company called RR Bussy that was bought by Vulcan. That was bought in, in the big agribusiness, that was bought by Hanson. So we've got that aggregate, which now in Florida, we had two large crushers. And the one crusher, when we built the one transfer station, we didn't even have to touch it because it was a company that that basically developed it all by itself across from the transfer station because we said we would accept that material. And so rather than going to us, go over our scale, uh, then we go right out to the crusher across the street operated by somebody else. So as we prospect the opportunities, whether it's renewable energy, which I, again, as Adam alluded to, I'm a patent holder on some biomass technologies where we actually make a densified fuel out of residuals that pretty much come from the back of the processing line uh, we also come from pulp and paper mill, but it burns like coal, acts like coal, just no carbon. And the state of Wisconsin actually approved that as a renewable fuel, specifically in their legislation, because it was made with waste materials, mostly uh, short fiber sludges that were going to the landfill. So it's a journey, not a race. Um, different things come up, and the recycling of uh, electronics was a great opportunity. Uh, it was bound to happen. Uh, nobody was focusing on it, and it created an opportunity for some of us uh, to make some money, but I'm a green capitalist. I, I say that proudly because I figured out ways to mainstream what was before sort of a leftist opportunity. And when my kids would say, what's your dad do? And they would say, well, he's a garbage man, which was okay. Uh, they said, well, he's a recycler. Well, now he does renewable energy. Well, it's just a different phases of my career, but I've always focused on residuals because there was always some gold there, right? Uh, now you talk about gold, rare earth metals, electronics, you talk about everything in that stream um, because resources are finite. So really what we do is resource management and how we allocate income tells us what we want to resource, what's popular now. But again, it starts all with, I was given the challenge to determine how to get through, how to recycle in the city of Chicago uh, when the municipality or the streets and sanitation department um, collected all the waste. They didn't care about the private sector waste. Their solid waste management plan was four guys on a garbage truck, literally four guys on a garbage truck, and collect from five units or less. There was 1.6 million tons of other stuff out there that was being done by the other companies. And then as we started mining into that, the resistance sort of dropped, but you had political will. Uh, obviously when I was at BFI, I gave Bill Rucklesshaus a lot of credit, because he didn't know what he was doing initially, uh, being the chairman, coming from EPA, but being the chairman uh, of a solid waste company, but he stood behind it. Our earnings went down. He said, every community we're going to do, my own, you got to go do a composting facility. So in Illinois, I did the first yard waste composting facility. It cost us more to get compost yard waste than it did per yard than go to the landfill, which was right next door to the composting facility. And we had more complaints about the composting facility than we did about the landfill. Now, that was operational.
but it was all new. So you had to, it's cultural, political, but at the end it's all about economics. You know, uh, these things have to be done in a way where they make sense. Simpler is usually better. Uh, the green collar jobs, I'd like to say I was responsible throughout all the three or four careers I've had embarking on, you know, the next one is this advocacy that I do. Uh, as mentioned, I was a founding board member of the Delta Institute, and we were one of the first aggregators uh, on the Chicago Climate Exchange as a non-for-profit. Why did we do that? Because we started the carbon program in Illinois with the Chicago Climate Exchange. We started the carbon trading program in the state of Michigan as a result of, of that, of those efforts, and aggregated, I think, to date, uh, over three million tons. And we did it in a way that was verifiable, so it's, now it's routine. Um, now, unfortunately, carbon, because it's not mandated, uh, is very low, but we started doing methane. Uh, methane, my background in methane came from the landfills. It was required by regulation to extract methane. We did the first landfill that was done with energy recovery voluntarily, just to prove it can be done. So that would have been 1990, 1991, I can't remember. So then everybody said, well, why are you doing that? Well, it can be done. Well, there was tax credits at that time, so somebody took the tax credits. We got to do the project. When the tax credits went away, the project went away. Well, that was sort of the, the walk before you run, but the crawl before you walk. So you sort of learn things now. And now you look at the opportunities talk about land for solar and wind, the landfill site. Because they're usually 500 acres, uh, but the permitted area where the land, where the actually trash is actually put in is only maybe 300 acres, maybe 200 acres, maybe 100 acres. And then you have all this available land. You can then get methane, wind, and solar uh, being sold to the grid off from one unit. And not to plug a former competitor, but I was out in Virginia last week working on a beneficial use program for one of the paper mills, but waste management has at the Amelia County Landfill, I forget what they call it, but I call it the Amelia Landfill, they have about a 20 megawatt recovery system, methane recovery generating electricity, and we're trying to work with them on some of their coal ashes coming in to apply the technology that we have to 100% recycle and make the lightweight aggregate. Now when we make lightweight aggregate, you make lightweight aggregate naturally by firing it in a kiln, a 500 foot kiln. Uh, 2,000 degrees, formerly blending and using hazardous waste, um, but now using coal and fossil fuel. We can do the same thing in a fossil-free fashion, and we do it all with airflow. Uh, but those are patents. Uh, I worked as a consultant on that project that was built across from the GE plant. Uh, it was shut down because the market, well, the market is now is the stormwater uh, block. So you have to have you have to have that innovation every step of the way. Don't get discouraged. But it's really about you know the journey. And now the journey has sort of led me here, so this advocacy that I feel uh, compelled to do, uh, still do some consulting, environmental consulting, because that's what pays the bills. Um, but this beneficial use of resources is really you know, where we're going to end up. And with renewable energy, it makes sense because it saves people money. Now, distributed renewable energy, I think, is where we're going to you know, end up at some point. So how do you, how do you dovetail in uh, the rooftop with the grid? And that's the challenge. All right? And that's more of a contractor marketing effort on that, because if he knows that he can do that, and he knows what those costs are, and you spend a little time up front on that, uh, you have to determine if you're going to solar the whole whole roof, which is a great idea, solar the whole roof, and how much you need for a parasitic load to operate your business versus what goes back to the grid. And same thing with wind. We worked in Hawaii on Kauai and had a great, a, a great project uh, using some residuals, uh, basically from the sugarcane business there, uh, having manufacturing sort of a, a biofuel uh, by just densifying it from the solid waste transfer station, and it's an island, and it has the highest cost of electricity in the United States. At that time, it was 32 cents a kilowatt hour, and we still couldn't get the project approved because the, we forced the utility to look at it, and the utility went through an RFP process, and they took the top two, and unfortunately, we were third. So in the first two, went out of the way, we didn't get the call back. So we spent two and a half years on that project, but what they did is they did do some wind, they did do some solar, uh, they're still trying to do the biomass. Uh, but you look at Connecticut, Connecticut's the second highest utility rate, I believe, in uh, the United States. So there's opportunities for solar, there's opportunities for wind, there's strategic opportunities for biomass, depending on using residual feedstocks. But we can handle all these challenges, and the challenges are really, are just business opportunities waiting to happen.